Hi everybody, my name is Jeff Fowler, President of the Apartment Owners Association, and it is great to have you with us today. Uh, we have uh, live with us a, a, a landlord-tenant attorney, and he'll be able to answer your questions after uh, presentation that he shares with us. Before we get into that, AOA has been around for over 40 years, and we're one of the largest individually organized groups of apartment owners here in the state. And that's not so important, but what is important is that we, uh, we're providing you with the forms. We have a property management advice hotline, tenant screening software, property management software, and the magazine, the trade shows, the seminars, multiple ways to equip you to manage your property better and just to have peace of mind and, and kind of get a grasp on all the, all the things that are going on. Uh, and so anyway, our attorney today, he is in the local LA area, so he'll probably won't be able to answer questions from Northern California unless it's things that relate to just general uh, California state law. He'll be able to address those. And, it, and of course, before you put those questions in, um, it helps if we know location, how many units, just a little information will help us for sure. And on the 16th, uh, we're going to be in Buena Park, and it will be a, uh, a seminar about how to screen your tenants properly and avoid those discrimination lawsuits when it comes to tenant screening. And that will be uh, given by an attorney. And then there will be a second uh, seminar as well that will be about estate planning, how to bulletproof your assets. And so that should be a great time. I know it will be, knowing who's speaking. And also in San Diego at the same time, there's another doubleheader there. So uh, just check the seminar schedule to see exactly what's going on, register for those. And then 22nd and 23rd, I believe we have how to properly screen tenants. And again, that'll be up in Long Beach and in Sherman Oaks. So check the seminar schedule and register for those. And then uh, last but not least, on May 21st, we have the San Diego Landlording Power Conference. We'll have seven different speakers there and some vendors. If you're in Orange County or San Diego, highly encourage you to go to that and um, just learn and, and rub shoulders with people that are in the same boat that you are. And um, anyway, so again, we're here to try to keep you in the know. And um, yeah, yeah, so here we go. Um, our, just want to give a shout out to Dignity Law Group for sponsoring this event. And they're really an up and coming law firm. They've been around since 2018. So hadn't been around for a long time, but um, they are a vanguard of legal innovation. And they're led by partners David Green and Joseph Kellner, who personally handle and litigate each case with their team of paralegals and legal assistants and clerks. And um, anyway, so they, they cover real estate litigation, personal injury, criminal defense, family law, and general litigation. But I think they've really kind of settled. They do all of those things, but they really do have a niche with the um, with eviction, having to deal with the eviction cases. And so our speaker today ha has been ranked by super lawyers, oh, as super lawyers rising star from like 2016 until 2022. So he's just, he's on a hot streak and um, just has a lot of different acknowledgements and he's a part of multiple things. Instead of reading the long list out, I'll let him introduce himself. And um, yeah, so it's my pleasure to, to introduce to you today, uh, David Green. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Very, very kind introduction and uh, I appreciate that and thank you to AOA for having me here. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I am a partner in a litigation firm in Van Nuys, which is the second biggest court in Los Angeles. And I'd say about 80% of our practice deals in the landlord tenant space. We do both uh, eviction defense, eviction prosecution, and we handle a wide range of litigation matters between landlords and tenants. So, um, 
I think that we have a unique perspective because we are literally in court every single day. And for those of you in the audience who probably have ongoing evictions or perhaps have dealt with evictions since uh, the moratorium has ended, uh, you probably know it's kind of a mess. So what I was hoping to do here is not only give you guys an overview of who we are and what we do, but also give you some updates on the law and some of the trends that we see on a daily basis in the eviction courts. And I mean specifically in the Van Nuys, Stanley Mosque, and surrounding uh, state courts and their UD departments. Um, I'd like to start by telling you, as you probably know, being a landlord is not what it was for any prior generation. The uh, landscape for landlord liability and landlords being on the hook is unlike anything we've really ever seen. Um, so my partner, Joseph, who is standing off camera, but he's in trial, so he's gonna be leaving in a few minutes. He, he uh, suggested to me that I should kind of walk you through what an eviction right now is happening uh, in Stanley Moss Court, for example. There are four departments in Stanley Moss that handle unlawful detainers. Each one probably has 30 matters on calendar every single morning, every single afternoon. Um, it used to be, and you do have a statutory right to a speedy trial with unlawful detainers, possession matters are given priority, but there is such a backup that you get to the point now where you go in, the uh, defense lawyers typically will not stipulate to commissioners. Uh, three of those courtrooms are commissioners. So you may find yourself getting into court, finally getting into court after the notice, after everything has happened, you get into court. The other side says, we're not gonna hear, we're not gonna be heard by this judge. You have to go to a different department. That department already has 60 things on calendar. You just get kicked down the road. And that is just the beginning of the long path that you will have to endure just to find out if you even have the right paperwork. Um, and I, I mean that literally, there are so many law firms who represent landlords on a daily basis who forget to dot an I, forget to cross a T, make a human error, and the defense uh, litigators, they don't tell you that. What they do is they kind of sit there, they play the game, they let it roll down the hill, and then when you get to trial, they go, oh, by the way, there was this. And you have to dismiss your case and start all over again. And that is really probably the, uh, the rule, not the exception. The exception is everything's perfect. You show up, you demand your trial, you make a motion that they have to pay rent during the time that it's delayed. But it doesn't really ever happen right now. Um, so as I mentioned, there are probably 30 cases on any given calendar in the morning. My partner Joseph last week showed up on Monday, all the trial docs, everything's ready, no court. Showed up Tuesday, sorry, now you're fifth in line, still no court. Showed up Wednesday, no court. Thursday, we have a court, the other side says we don't want that court. Oh, we gotta find you another court. Friday, there are no more courts. Come back next week, see what happens. And that's one of thousands of cases in queue to go to trial. So I think it's important for landlords to realize that if getting possession of your property back in a very fast way is the most important thing to you, you need to have kind of a bird's eye view of what the system is and how long it really takes. Um, it used to be when Joe and I started working together, we would tell landlords can't make any promises, but they typically are, you know, 60, 75 days out. That's when we'll get to trial. Uh, right now we tell our clients, if you're lucky, 
will be in trial in three months. And we don't say that because we don't know how to get it into the front of the line as, as uh, the statutes allow, but that is just the reality of the backlog uh, here in Los Angeles. The other thing that we are seeing more and more and more uh, is not only uh, tenant defense kind of hiding the ball and playing that type of game, but there's also a surge in, in a uh, kind of punch back, if you will, from tenants. And uh, I'm sure many of you have filed an eviction only to learn later that your tenant now has claims of habitability and uh, all sorts of things that were wrong with the unit. And it's filed in a different court and you need to pay to defend that. And um, there, there's essentially a big loophole that any tenant can play to cost you the money that you're hoping to avoid spending either way. And that is something that has really only come about since COVID-19. I, I would attribute it as a recent phenomena, but that's from my experience. I brought with me today, and I was uh, telling Jeff about this before we went on air. So the Daily Journal is a uh, law publication here in Los Angeles. I'm not plugging them or anything, but if you're a lawyer and you want to buy it, they send you a paper every day with the updates. And on uh, Tuesday, there was an article that made me aware of a city ordinance just passed here in Los Angeles. And the ordinance, I'll just tell you in case any of you are very inquisitive, is uh, Ordinance 187692, and you can Google that. And I would just encourage you to look on page 20, and in, in short, what it says is, in Los Angeles now, if a tenant's median income is uh, less than, I think, 76,000 or so, they will be given defense lawyers paid for by the city to defend them in eviction. So it used to be that you uh, don't have a right to counsel in civil matters, especially unlawful detainer matters. You don't have a right to counsel. You can pay a lawyer to defend you. This ordinance, uh, which is now in effect, uh, or soon to be in effect, um, this allows for any tenant who is served with an eviction to get a lawyer paid for by the city. And if I'm reading the writing on the wall, these lawyers are probably going to play those same types of games I mentioned earlier, and they are probably going to uh, make it very time consuming and expensive to prosecute evictions going forward in the city. I uh, moved to California 23 years ago and my wife and I have built a family here. I, I own a home here. Um, and I see kind of in the system itself, a real shift. And that shift is to provide for people who don't have and to hold accountable people who do have. Uh, one of the biggest things I think that AOA and uh, other such um, kind of organizations do, which is so important, is they give you the forms. You need to comply with the law. You need to do every little thing that is required because if you don't, that is the opportunity for some of those tenant defense lawyers to just, you miss this, you miss that. Um, it has become a, a system that the shields meant to protect the tenants are now just being used as swords to attack the landlords. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is all um, somewhat familiar to all of you. I think that now, in 2024, being as professional and buttoned up as a landlord as you can be is going to be the only way to manage the current landscape. Um, there have also been some other laws that have passed recently, and uh, Jeff was uh, mentioning to me that, you know, starting April 1st, you know, there's more liability for landlords. 
Um, as you probably also know, the no-fault evictions that used to be standard throughout Los Angeles County are being tapered down, tapered down, and tapered down. Um, recently, we had a case where a new purchaser bought a duplex and one of the tenants uh, who they intended to remove with a 60-day notice, in the midst of it, after paying all the relocation uh, assistance to the trust and doing all the requisite paperwork. She took her daughter to the hospital. The hospital determined that she now has a disability and now they are a protected tenant. So this property investor has no option but to let them live there at the rent controlled rate um, for the foreseeable future. And that's just one of the many realities that I think we all need to be aware of. I don't think that the legislature is necessarily passing laws to make it more attractive or uh, more incentivized for people to invest in Los Angeles as a uh, uh, multifamily or, or large residential investment. But I do think that that is, that is the message you need to convey to your uh, local representatives. It really does start at the government level. Um, for those of you in Los Angeles, if you've ever been to a city council meeting, it is a wild uh, thing. You will see people with shirts and, and placards and the tenant uh, support groups are very vocal. And um, groups like AOA, and people like yourselves, I just encourage you to be as vocal. Um, don't be afraid to point out the unfairness and the uh, kind of the long-term consequences of this type of legislation. Um, I don't know if you want me to move to questions or if you want me to kind of continue on. What would you like, Jeff? Yeah, if you have any, are there any updates that you have for us? Like so there are a few. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there are a few updates that I think are worthy of noting if you don't know them already. The law with respect to security deposits has changed. It's codified under uh, 1950.5, and it was amended. Um, it, it was amended to basically restrict any security deposit that's not a mom and pop uh, to one month as opposed to two months or three months, depending on who the type of tenant was and all of that. Uh, that's a big change. I think it's uh, worthy of note. I also would point out that the legislature also passed the responsibility on to subsequent buyers. Some of you may know that a security deposit is uh, technically the property of the tenant. So there is a mandatory obligation for a landlord to hold it. Uh, for rent controlled properties here in Los Angeles, you're actually supposed to be accruing interest on it, which also becomes a tenant's property. But now 1950 reads, if you uh, essentially sell the property or pass it on, you have obligations as the property owner. You have to notify the tenant of it. You have to essentially put prescribed language in that notice. And uh, you are still responsible should that security deposit not be returned if you fail to follow all the steps. And, uh, you know, to me, that's another uh, example of the same thing we've been talking about. It's an important law to know. Um, the uh, no fault evictions and the affirmative lawsuits that landlords now face under 1942.4 and for doing no fault evictions improperly are also a massive change and those just went into effect. Uh, essentially, you know, tenants who are given notices, if they do turn out to be wrong, if you are determined to be acting in bad faith, if you are determined to be um, giving notices that offend another statute, the tenants now have affirmative cases that they can bring and the statutes give them attorney's fees and costs. So you will see, my prediction is, you will see a trend in lawyers who are willing to bring those types of cases, pump up the attorney's fees, and try and get maximum value uh, for fairly minor statutory violations.
Great. Well, thank you yeah, for I've... sharing with us and for just being available right now. To Absolutely. Questions. And yeah, that's uh, for that, the um, security deposit, that's, that takes effect in July. Is that right? July I think 1st? so. Yeah, so that's July 1st, but yet yeah, there's a whole lot, there's other things that took, took effect on um, April 1st. April 1st. So here we go. We have Jim. If you have a question, if you're watching on AOAUSA.com, <clears throat> there's a blue help button at the bottom right side of the screen, and you can type your question in there, and they'll uh, get that over to us. But right now we do have Jim on YouTube, so let's see what he has to ask. What, what's the best way to get squatters out of the house if they've been there for less than 30 days? Well, that's a, uh, that's a question I think a lot of people are trying to figure out. Uh, my friend actually just sent me a article about a group called the squ 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 Squatter Squad. Yeah, there you go. Um, so self-help is illegal in California, as you know. The police are being less and less responsive to claims of trespass or when they do show up and someone claims to be a tenant, they seem to defer to that claim. Uh, it is a very challenging um, situation to be in. I, have a, I am of the belief that getting a uh, alarm system that is registered with the county if you're a property owner, uh, that is a special type of registry. It contacts the police in a different way in the event the alarm goes off or, or someone enters your property while the alarm is active. Um, I think that that is probably the best method for avoiding squatters taking possession in the first place. But once they're already there, what I understand the squatter squad to do is uh, they essentially file for emergency work permits, something of that nature, and have uh, the right to essentially come to the property to make significant changes, to remove anyone there. Um, and they do it on kind of an emergency basis for the permitting, get the crew in there, get everyone out. And from what I understand, when the police arrive, they show that they have the requisite permits, that they are the title holder and all of that. But it is a uh, really a case-by-case -case basis. There is no easy solution to squatters. And um, I'd also encourage you to, to make note with your local law enforcement, whether it be the sheriff's department or the police department, <laughs> that this is a problem, that you, you know, hope that they will be more vigilant and I did just read in Florida, they passed a anti-squatter legislation. So mm -hmm. be on your, uh, <coughs> be on your uh, local representatives to enact that type of legislation here or where you are. Yeah, I mean, things really have changed. If you think about it before, you just stick the for rent sign up in the, law, in the yard and you don't even think twice about it. Now, you've, before you plant that, that baby into the lawn, you're thinking, am I going to get a squatter? <laughs> someone to break into my house if they see this and uh so yeah things have things are changing a little bit all right so thank you jim for that one love moves on youtube what are section 8 special rules for special considerations how many days do landlords have to give section 8 tenants to move out okay we'll just we'll do one at a time here yeah so what are the special considerations well section 8 has its own purview so there are you when you're dealing with a section 8 voucher tenant um, and just another thing and aside to mention about section 8 uh, there was a trend and I think it's more or less died down here in Los Angeles whereby uh, section 8 tenants or someone who has section 8 voucher would just call landlords or apply for places asking whether or not uh, the place would accept Section 8. And in the event that the landlord or the representative or the property manager said, no, we don't take Section 8, they would bring a lawsuit uh, under the Civil Rights Act because in theory it is illegal to discriminate on source of income. Uh, I think that's very important just as an aside that if you do get a applicant who is Section 8, uh, you do not want to ever say that you will not accept Section 8 uh, vouchers or that you don't take Section 8 tenants. You can still vet a tenant however you want, but that cannot be uh, the basis for denying a applicant. Um, but 
Section 8 has its own um, special notices. It has its own special procedure. And they're also given an administrative overview. So to the extent that the tenant who is on Section 8 claims certain things, and there's a kind of a, a, a litany of things that they can claim that should give them special consideration, more time, hardship, any of the same, that is all through that administrative process. And it's usually by written record and you are given an appeal right. So on that, like it, let's say someone were to come to you with, with a Section 8 tenant that they want to evict, mm -hmm. that they, there's, ju there's just a just cause for. So what's the pr what would the process be for that? Do so, you contact Section 8 first, or how does that work? Yeah, you do it simultaneously. You don't want to serve a notice prior to noticing Section 8 uh, because that in just by... Uh, the language of it violates it. So yeah, you, you would need to start by notifying Section 8 that you're commencing it. I think you now have to give them a copy of the notice. Um, and then you would proceed to serve the notice properly. Um, and the clock starts then. Great. All right. And then how many days do landlords need to give Section 8 tenants for move out? Well, again, it depends on the premise. Um, but typically, they're all 60-day notices. Okay, great. All right. So, Mary, and on YouTube, does LA Ordinance 18.5692 also apply to property in the unincorporated LA County area? It's a great question. So, um, it is not. The language of the ordinance speaks to the city of Los Angeles. Typically, when it is uh, defined thereby, it, it is restricted to what is inside of the city of Los Angeles. As this question points out, when a property is in the county, but it's an unincorporated part of the county, they do still apply the most restrictive covenants. So in theory, it may apply to unincorporated areas of Los Angeles County, as well as the city. All right, Hira on YouTube. What is the interest rate on the security deposit? Do you have that one on I the don't top remember. of your head? So that, the interest rate I mentioned is only specific to uh, Larso properties, properties under the Los Angeles Rent Stabilization Ordinance. I think it's 7%, but I think it also no. depends on certain years. No? What is it? It's far less. Yeah. Okay. Seven percent. It's it's you not. It's much less. Yeah. I apologize. I, I was uh, trying to remember off the top of my head. All right. All right. Thank you, uh, Hira. And then Sylvina, if attorney fees are limited to five hundred in the rental agreement, can the tenant get more than five hundred for violating what you just mentioned? Yeah. So that's a great question. So when uh, you sue essentially on a breach of contract theory or a theory that arises out of the lease. That is when you're capped at that attorney fees amount. Uh, 1940, Civil Code 1942.4 and the related kind of penalties, the penalty statutes for landlords doing things that are prohibited by law or other statute, those are independent causes of action. They're brought in a totally different court. They are not brought in the unlawful detainer court. They're brought in the unlimited civil court. Um, and the $500 in all likelihood would not apply because it would not be an action uh, premised on the, the lease agreement. All right, Jim, FYI in Riverside County, the DA's office recognizes that the Walls case is still controlling and therefore they are simply trespassers and should be arrested by DA investigators for 602 PC. I completely agree. I, I, I follow that line of thinking. Unfortunately, Los Angeles, um, our district attorney is a bit more liberal. Yeah. All right, Jonathan, let's see. Can you comment on the new requirements, uh, the new requirement that Section 8 applicants must be given an alternative to the credit? Uh, can you scroll down a little bit on that one? to the credit report requirement. Can you comment on the new requirement that goes section eight applicants must be given an alternative to credit report requirement? I'm sorry, Jonathan, I can't. Um, 
I, I don't know if it's my lack of understanding the question, but to the extent that there is a new credit that I'm unaware of, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to it here and now. Right, and I think, yeah, yeah, that one, I'm not sure that there's, I know that there's, there's, um, yeah, we'll just let that one go by. I okay. don't want to give any more incorrect information after my 7% uh, flub yeah. earlier. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's always better to just say, you know. Yeah, I try. Give me a call. Sometimes, it, my phone number, sometimes a, a number call. pops in my head, and yeah. I think that might be it. Uh, what are the changes for pet rent and deposit? Um, That's a trick question, kind of. Yeah, it really depends. It's on a lease by lease basis. I don't think that there are any straight restrictions unless it's some kind of disability or, um, you know, a, uh, what do they call them? The dog therapy well, dogs well, or anything like that; those I know are, are more or less yeah, untouchable. Are you, Melody, are you allowed to do pet rent? Uh, you can do pet rent. The pet deposit is considered part of the security. Right. Policy. Okay. Yeah. So pet rent is okay. Pet deposit is not a not okay. Right. And even if it were okay, when you go to uh, you know when they ask for their deposit back, then they'll dispute like, well. The dog didn't do anything wrong to the property, so you need to give me the full pet rent back. So there's... Those floors were scuffed like that years anyway, ago. So, um, and then just regular deposit, the change, he, I believe he mentioned, but it's, it'll be restricted to one month of rent for the security deposit starting July 1st. And um, I believe that applies to um, everyone who has two units or more and less... Four units. Four or more. units. Yeah, four yeah. units or more. Yeah, mom right. and pop. Mom and pops got exempt. I think sort mom of. and pops is up to like a hundred units. Yeah. Oh well, then they didn't. <laughs> it's a. It's I a, mean, my mom and pops. They should have said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they should have said institutional investor versus yes. private investor. That would have been better. The, yeah. Okay. Can we enforce renter's insurance on tenants? So maybe I, how? Yeah. I think the, how is better. the tricky part. Mm -hmm. um, Honestly, 90% of the calls we get should be renter's insurance. They should be calls to the rental insurance uh, claim line, but um, you can put in your lease that they are required to do it. Enforcing that is very difficult, obviously. Um, I've also heard of, we've had some clients who are, are landlords who essentially take out the policy on the tenant's behalf with the tenant's consent. and. Um, that can be a way to, I guess, ensure that there will be a rental insurance policy in, in place. But you can put in the contract that they're supposed to do it, whether or not that would be grounds for getting possession back or even a breach of contract action. It may not be worth the squeeze. Right. So it's in the AOA rental agreement. It's just you can't evict for that, yeah. unfortunately. Okay. YouTube, Woody, how will I get back rent from landlord who didn't have COO certificate of occupancy and I had to deal with tons of habitability issues yeah so uh, well Woody it would depend on when these issues arose uh, there are statutes of limitations with respect to habitability claims and there are also um, statutes of limitations with respect to most claims even if they're uh, born out of a contract or conduct. So it would depend on when it happened. You can feel free to reach out to us and, and yeah. speak with us about it, but disgorgement is usually uh, in action when you're still in possession. If you're not, it may be more challenging. All right, Abe on Facebook. For a commercial property, how much rent increase can the commercial landlord raise the rent? Well, it depends where you are, but for the most part, Commercial is a, a totally different animal. So there's a reason those uh, leases can be for very long periods of time in the interest of the tenant and the landlord. But um, yeah, there aren't really very many restrictions with respect to commercial property rent increases once the contract term has expired. All right, D. Pitt on YouTube. Please, I think they mean to say, please fill us in on upcoming props coming in November and how we should vote. Oh, I can't give you advice yeah. on how to vote. But um, I would just say, look, uh, when you s 
in my personal opinion, when you see actions that create liability for landlords or property owners, um, those are typically well-intentioned and have disastrous consequences. And I think specifically, they're probably asking about the Justice for Renters yeah. uh, Act that's going to be on the ballot in November. Uh, last time we did this, you see that the yard sign behind me, we made one of those for every single member and uh, it had a prop number to it. This one does not have a number on it yet. Uh, when it does, we will be mailing you. If you're an active AOA member, we're going to be mailing you one of those yard signs, hoping that you put it up in your yard, uh, in the yard of one of your properties, hoping that you get all your friends, that you ask us for more yard signs, and that you, you and all your friends stick those up and, and raise awareness of why repealing Costa Hawkins would be bad. Again, this, that this, this, what will be on the ballot will be to remove the protection of when a renter leaves your apartment and the next one comes in. Right now, you live in a free enough country where you can raise the rent to market. If that law is repealed, then local, ordin then local municipalities could go ahead and enact rent control on the vacancy. And if, if that were to happen, you can imagine how bad that would be, not just for investors, but also for the renters themselves. And um, anyway, so that one, we, we definitely will tell you how to vote on that one. <laughs> yeah. And also we do, we, we, this is for our industry, we do want to let you know who, which candidates are uh, more likely to be on the side of protecting property rights. And we did have an article for the March 5th ballot. We, uh, we published one from Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. So that's a great group. They look and they research on a state level. Local level stuff, it gets a little more difficult to really tell who's doing what. Um, but yeah, so we'll all have to do our research. And uh, before that, we, I think it would be great if we could AOA hopefully will get an article out that will kind of be somewhat of a voter guide for property rights. And, um, you know, that's the best we'll, that we'll be able to do probably. All right, so Syl Sylvania, Sylvina, okay, a tenant typically will call the landlord indicating that something broke. What is the responsibility of the landlord when the tenant breaks it? Let's say a kitchen counter door or a stove. Yeah, it's a very common challenge. Um, my advice is always as a landlord to limit your liability, to limit um, things being escalated unnecessarily. And there are career tenants who do this, who, who will come into a property and just cause problem after problem after problem and then find a lawyer who will sue on those problems. And um, my advice is always bite your lip, get it fixed. If you do want to pursue the costs of getting it fixed, you can do it in a small claims action. You can do it pursuant to the contract or the lease. But um, letting things remain damaged or unabated creates real liability. So you, they do have the right to ask for if they clearly break something. Yeah, of course. They, they have the right to ask. Of for course, that. yeah, and that is typically but in the language of the lease itself. Right. But yeah, if you end up fighting about a two hundred dollar fix and they decide to call code enforcement or the, uh, you know, if they start escalating things, it only does more harm. Right. And that just also, it's a good reminder before they move in or like when you're giving them the keys to document, take pictures of everything just so that that's on file. This is the condition that we're entrusting this unit to you with and, you know, all that just documentation is great. Let's yeah. see. Okay. I'm new to the landlord game as I have a multi-unit currently being built in the San Gabriel Valley, one of the requirements from the city is creating CC and R's for the development. Can your firm create such a document? Well, you can definitely contact us. We do deal with CC and R's and um, they're typically in condo associations or, or you know, kind of shared um, developments. But if they're a requirement, we, we can talk about it if you give us a call. All right. MJ5, my, there it is. My lease require, 
my lease requires renter's insurance, but some of my tenants have failed to provide proof or even purchase it. As a mom and pop landlord, what recourse do I have? Well, in theory, um, you know, Jeff, Jeff brought up, it's, it's not a tenable premise by which to seek possession, meaning if you, if you were to try bring an eviction material breach of the lease or, or just for failing to do that, it probably would not be successful. That being said, you do still have a contract. Uh, both sides are supposed to adhere to the terms of that contract. If one side breaches that contract, in theory, you have a claim on that contract. I don't think many lawyers would um, bring those types of lawsuits, but that's what the self, uh, the small claims courts are for and the um, kind of self legal uh, jurisdictions are for. All right. Alfredo on YouTube is a three unit. It's a duplex in a single house considered mom and pop property when the owner lives in one of one unit of duplex and to relocate a tenant. What would be the cost? This property is under rent control. Yeah, I always um, tell my clients, you need to contact the housing authority. At the end of the day, it's under their purview. We have had many cases where the housing authority gives us a number. We get that money into the uh, relocation account and then the housing authority com comes back to us and goes, nope, it's a different number or nope, it's actually this. So uh, that will happen either way. If you make the determination yourself, you're very likely to have them perhaps inform you differently. I think the best course of action is start with the housing department, see what number they say and go from there and see if you qualify under their definitions of, of what type of property it is. Right, so normally what would exemption be, exemption from that? If it's, is it, are they talking about LA City? It, well, he's talking about rent control. So uh, currently under rent control, if you do a owner move in, which is uh, historically, you just did the 60 days and you gave them uh, you know, a month or, or whatever uh, was required. Now for any 60 day move in, you essentially have to not only notify the housing department that you're doing it, notify the tenant that you're doing it, put the money in a, a escrow account or a, a, a trust account, and then provide them with relocation assistance, literally someone who will help them try and find another place. So uh, there aren't too many exemptions for, for that being the case if the property is a multifamily. Single family, there are some exemptions. Right, and if it's duplex with the owner, move in living in on one side of yeah. it then it's not it would be exempt i don't think so i don't think so but i'm not gonna okay. i'm not gonna take a, right. a firm line there all right here we go the uh, love moves if a tenant claims hardship while renting and wants part of their deposit back to help with costs uh, are we not required by any law to return their deposit until after they move out Correct. So if you're talking about uh, Civil Code 1950.5, it is meant to be held in the event that there is damage or, or something, uh, delinquency in rent at the time that the, the tenant um, leaves the property. In fact, I think that the language of the statute require you to hold it for the entirety of the tenancy. So I don't think you would want to touch that money, even if it is for their benefit. Um, that would be my, my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Does Section 8 require an inspection of the property? They wanted me to level the entire slab floor of my single rental house because of one centimeter difference from one end to the other. Are inspections still required? Yeah. Uh, so you would want to contact uh, Section 8. I believe they do do an inspection uh, prior to allowing the transaction to go through, meaning uh, that they are paying for it, but you would have to contact them. I'm not aware of exemptions to that. All right. Nancy, if a tenant no longer has renter's insurance and something happens that would normally be, that, that would normally be covered, is the landlord owner liable even if it says in the lease that they should not be? And uh, do I need an additional addendum for that? Yeah, I mean, it's not really something you could in my opinion, contract out of pursuant to a lease. Um, at the end of the day, when you have substandard conditions, and by that I just mean any violation of Civil Code 1941.1 or the Health and Safety Code that give you the minimum requirements for a 
rental property and the violative conditions, if you allow those to persist, you, you risk liability. So you might have a claim against them for it, but it would be kind of a collateral mm. claim to something that would be much worse. All right. Uh, Sylvina, water heater breaks occasionally. How quickly does the landlord need to replace it in the city of LA under RSL? Yeah, so uh, fixes generally in the city and county of Los Angeles are a reasonableness standard. And um, that is kind of a uh, subjective standard for the finder of fact, whether it be a judge or jury. I think if you can show that you made good faith efforts, efforts generally to um, deal with the problem and abate it, you can poke some holes in whether or not you acted unreasonably or failed to address it. All right, Dad Tarek, I think you've asked this question before. Um, must I ask tenants permission to enter the yard to do yard work? Well, it depends on the type of property and it would depend on uh, whether or not they are given full use and access or, or possession of that part of the property. So let's so, assume it's a single family home. Yeah backyard yeah typically you would want to give 24-hour notice 24-hour notice yeah. so it's just like um, just any any type of uh, was it 1954 mm -hmm. yeah and we do have a, a whole video about um, just getting the right to enter entering the property and we did that just like maybe the beginning of March so look in the videos look at the live video part on YouTube and that should be in there. And I think we're gonna put that one in the, just for, make it for AOA members, but we just haven't gotten around to it yet. I think it's always good practice as a landlord to give notice. Even yeah. if even if you think, you know, it might be over overdoing it, you just don't wanna create a narrative whereby you're dropping by or coming in unannounced. Um, you know, I, I, I don't mean to keep diving into statutes, but there was the anti-harassment ordinance that passed um, during COVID, and that also gives attorneys fees and all those things, and harassment is not well defined in there. So I'd be, I'd be safe. I'd play safe. Mm -hmm. Great. Carolyn, I have a non-rent control property, but haven't served the AB 1482 exemption. Can I still serve it? Yes. You, the language is very specific, and it's mandatory, and there was a date but uh, you're not gonna be precluded from ever doing it. It's better to do it. Yeah. And that's not something, that's just a notice. They don't have to sign that? Or yeah, do you try to do both of them? Or what do you, what do you think? I, I like documenting everything. So I always encourage my uh, property owner clients to any notice, not only make a copy of it, take a picture of you uh, putting it somewhere <laughs> with a time and date stamp, cross all the, uh, Cross all the boxes because that's a very great example of a technical argument that could be used on after you finish your case in chief to just get a directed verdict because you didn't comply with this. Mm -hmm. All right, Cray on YouTube. A tenant moves in and moves out in three days. It's a one year lease. They claim secondhand smoke from the neighboring property. What is my obligation to mitigate damages and return security deposit? They yeah. want the security deposit return. Yeah, I, I think you might want to contact a lawyer, Craig, but uh, I'll tell you generally, you do have an obligation to mitigate damages when a property is knowingly vacant and it was previously available for rent. You do at least need to show some effort that you're trying to re-rent it. Um, but I think you should probably give us or another firm a call to to talk that one through three days they probably didn't do any damage no to the property probably so not the security deposit seems like well if he's using it for unpaid rent or for the rent that oh, uh yeah. so oh yeah call, that's right that's call the other firm. part of it yep instead of requiring a security deposit what do you think of a landlord buying security deposit replacement insurance and up the rent to cover the cost it's pretty clever um I, I don't really have an uh, opinion on it, but I do think that that is a clever way of going about that if you can make that work. Right. So my dad would never, ever go for that. <laughs> and it's just kind of like if you're old school, the thought would be if you don't have enough cushion or enough financial acumen to 
have a, a few months worth of cushion, then you're not the type of person that I want to rent to. So that, that would be the old school uh, way of thinking. And maybe I'm old school. I think that you would rather have that kind of tenant, right? One that has a little cushion. And so uh, we see those products that are out there where you can buy that. I just, what's better about a security deposit is that they get that money back. And um, so what's better for the tenant, if you think about it, it's better if they have that money up front because if they're paying that, that kind of a security deposit fee, at the end of it, they don't, they don't have anything. There's nothing for them. Uh, they don't get anything back. So. It's like leasing a car. Yeah, it's like a lease, and I, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's great. Okay, YouTube. Liev, landlord hires company to perform inspection on inside of rental unit. Is the landlord obligated to give a copy of any report to the tenant upon request? Well, it depends, um, but typically no. Uh, you don't want to unnecessarily create a suspicion or uh, an issue of a non-issue, but it's, it really would depend. Um, there's not a one-size-fits-all one answer for that. All right. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, if if it was like a everything's good type of yeah, you would want inspection to show it. report. Right. It seems like you'd want to give it, but also put your, you know, put yourself in their shoes. It's their health, their their concern, and you know, you could it'd be helpful probably to. So we most often see that issue with mold reports. Yeah. And I'll tell you, we don't litigate mold. I don't know many lawyers who do litigate mold in California. As you know, they're carved out of most insurance policies. And the burden of evidence for someone claiming mold exposure and, and damage is so high. Uh, you have to have experts, you have to have mold experts, medical experts, you have to have, you know, property uh, management and environmental specialists come testify. Those cost tens of thousands of dollars uh, to, to prosecute and experts will say, no, yes, it, 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 I just don't, um, yeah. That's, yeah. That's when I see that issue come up. Okay, Sylvina, what kind of notices needed to require the tenant to remove barbecue from the balcony? Well, it depends if it's a material breach of the lease or the terms of the uh, contract, you may want to give that. If it's creating a nuisance, creating you know damage to property or, or uh, a risk, you could go under that. Um, it would just depend how you want to approach it. But Is typically it it's a- Like a three-day cure No, it's to comply, yeah. yeah. Cure, or quit. Mm -hmm. All right, Alfredo, how often can I inspect the property when tenant acquired recently a pet? Can I charge pet rent? Two questions. There's more there. No, it's we'll, like four questions. Yeah, we'll start with yeah. we'll do one thing at a time. Um, so you can inspect a property with proper notice, but again, to my point earlier, you don't want to necessarily create a semblance of harassment or uh, anything like that. So I would, I would exercise some restraint in how often you uh, use that as the reason to come inspect. Okay. My understanding is if a tenant gets a pet after the tenancy has began uh, and it is silent to the terms of that in your lease agreement, you would probably want to propose an addendum to deal with the, the pet and the pet rent. If it is an emotional service dog or, or one of those um, disability associated with animals, I would caution you not to uh, take much action. You could find yourself facing a uh, FIHA or a similar type complaint. Okay, Lilia, do I have to pay relocation fees when I have an eviction for not paying rent? It's in no. Yeah. If it's non-payment of rent, relocation's on the table. Right. So just cause, those are the things. The tenant did something to get themselves evicted. You never have to pay rent. You never have to re pay a relocation fee in that instance unless you're settling with them. Well, they'll ask some... for it. 
They will still show up at court and say, you, I'm entitled to this relocation. That happens every day. Does it really? Yeah. And you will have defense lawyers who don't know any better who will say, well, aren't they entitled to relocation? So you might find yourself in court talking about money, but if it's a non-payment of rent, they're not entitled to it. Right. Hey, well, thank you so much for taking oh. some time with us. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to your staff. Um, for those of you watching at home, this is a, quite a production. Um, <laughs> they really have, have done this very professionally. And Jeff and the whole team here has been just wonderful. So uh, thank you for giving me some of your time. If any of you need to reach out to us, have questions, I try and answer all calls so our uh can i give our phone number and, and website yeah, or is so that on the there phone already number, they can see that oh up great there. it's 323 yep 212-5365 you can see you guys can see that posture screen <laughs> later on and uh and 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 uh give them a call for sure yeah and my partner and i joseph we uh we truly litigate landlord tenant disputes five days a week so we are usually in court most mornings, but if you want to reach out to us, questions, concerns, potential litigation, please do. So best time to call you then? I'd say around lunch. Lunchtime is a great time to call. There yeah. you go. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. And, um, yeah, we'll see you next week, I guess.